following lecture was produced by Glorian Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. I was talking with a guy a couple of days ago who said, meditation is the hardest thing you can do. And this is a perspective shared by a lot of people. But the tradition of meditation, the ancient tradition, would disagree with that statement. Because the state of meditation itself is actually the natural state of the consciousness. It isn't something separate from our true identity. When you access the state of meditation, you're accessing your true being. That which you really are. That in itself is not difficult. It's natural. It's spontaneous. It simply exists. The problem that we have is that we've become so conditioned that we've lost access to that natural state. So for us, it appears as though meditation is difficult because the conditioning is what's preventing us from accessing it. So you see, meditation itself is not what's difficult. It's the conditioning that provides the difficulty. And this is a really important distinction. It may sound like philosophical splitting of hairs, but it actually is incredibly significant, incredibly important. So what makes the, that understandable is when we understand what the consciousness really is, not from a theoretical point of view and not from belief or from terms we read in a dictionary or what people have told us, but in our experience. In terms of facts, what is consciousness? Our consciousness. This is the starting point for effective spiritual life. Our experience, factually speaking. What are the facts? What can we observe? What can we confirm? What can we repeat? You see, we take a scientific approach. We're not looking for something simply to believe or to aspire to, something to wrap around ourselves as a security blanket in order to protect ourselves from the terrors of the world. Instead, we're looking for something that is confirmable, that is real, that can be experienced and known not in the future, but today, now. The state of meditation is a reality. The consciousness is a reality. So we start from our experience of that reality and we learn about it and we learn how to change it. If there were no possibility of change, there would be no hope. But we know we can change. We have that power. So if we start from a position of knowing facts, then we can change in a fundamental way 
towards achievable goals, towards realistic goals. But if we start from a point of view of deception, of lies we tell ourselves, of lies that we've heard from others but believe anyway, of things that aren't true that can't be proven, then we have no idea where we're going. And we have no idea what the outcome will be of our actions. This is the fundamental point of view that we emphasize over and over. Beliefs don't matter. We really don't care what you believe. Believe whatever you want. Let's talk about facts. Let's talk about confirmable, provable, experiential facts. So in our observation of facts, we see here two important uh, aspects. Facts, of course, are things that are real, that cannot be denied. Observation is a perception, not an idea, not an interpretation, not a thought, not a judgment, not analysis. It is simply observation, the perception of something that is real. So this is where we start if we want to learn real meditation and have a really effective spiritual life. Perception, of course, is consciousness itself. In the simplest way of defining it, consciousness is perception. If we can perceive, then we have consciousness. To understand that is maybe on the superficial level is quite simple, but to really understand it is not that simple. So some dictionaries say that consciousness is a state of being. It is knowledge of one's existence or condition, sensations, mental operations, acts, etc. You see, it is a state of perception, a state of observation. Consciousness is also defined as knowledge or perception of the presence of anything, an object, a state, a sensation. And it is an alert cognitive state in which you're aware of yourself and your situation. So these three definitions kind of say the same thing, but kind of complement each other as well. They talk about Something active. Something in motion. Something that is moving and changing. Consciousness is the basis of life. Every living thing has consciousness at its level. We as human beings have the consciousness of a human being. But we all know that animals also have consciousness at their level, at the level of an animal. They perceive. They have some awareness or cognizance of being alive. And they respond to other conscious beings. They have intelligence at their level. But plants do also. Plants also perceive. They respond to their environment. They respond to conditions. They have consciousness at their level. So do all living things. Molecules, cells, even down to the atomic level. Scientists have proven that even quanta, particles of light, have cognizance of being that. They make choices. They make decisions. They respond to their environment at their level. But what we don't really grasp is that consciousness goes far beyond the mere human being level, the humanoid level. We think somehow that we are the pinnacle of all conscious things. Somehow this humanity has developed this kind of arrogance that we think we are the greatest development of nature, the pinnacle, the peak of all living things. We are absolutely wrong. Dead wrong. 
But because our consciousness is so limited, we can't prove it. We have a lot of beliefs about higher beings, superior beings. A lot of beliefs and a lot of theories and a lot of ideas. But when someone says, I experienced God, or I talked to an angel, we think they're crazy. Don't we? No one would dare to go out in the street and say, God told me, or this angel told me, or Jesus told me. We look at them like, oh, this person's nuts. Even though we might be a religious person, generally our society condemns the very possibility that there could be a superior being who could communicate with us. But here in this tradition, we steadfastly reject that. Not out of belief, but out of experience. We know confirmable facts that anyone here who wants to have the experience of talking directly with a being who's superior to them can do it. You simply have to remove the conditioning that's preventing it. The conditioning on your own mind. You see, this image, which we call the tree of life, simply symbolizes levels of being, levels of consciousness, from the lowest to the highest. You see, <clears throat> the humanoid level is not high at all in terms of what's potential, what's possible in nature. Humanoid level is actually very low on the scale of existing beings. But our consciousness is so limited and so conditioned that we don't perceive that fact. In the past, we could. And that's how we were able to have the traditions that we have now about gods and goddesses and great masters and prophets and these other beings that we could see were at a higher level than us. But we've lost that because of the conditioning of the mind. Now we just have beliefs. What we're trying to express here is that all of these circles that you see on this map represent, you could say, dimensions or worlds or levels of subtlety in nature. The physical world in Hebrew is called Malkut, which means the kingdom. It is the lowest sphere here. And that's where we live. And all of these other worlds above are more subtle levels that are interpenetrating this one. They aren't above our heads. They aren't off in space somewhere. They are here, but more subtle than the physical realm. And they are all populated. All of them are populated with beings who vibrate at those levels of nature. And at the same time, right here are more dense levels of life. More dense, more dark, more heavy. We call those the hell realms. They aren't below us under the surface of the earth. They're right here. And we experience them according to the state of our mind. Our physical body is just a vessel for our psychological experience. And our psychological experience is mapped here on this graphic. Our psychological experience changes according to the condition of our psyche. Some of us live lives that are just hell. Constant suffering. Constant anger and lust and envy and fear psychological suffering. That is hell, which we're experiencing through our physical bodies. That hell level is represented in this lower shadow of the tree, which is called klipot, which in Hebrew means empty shells. That isn't in some other place. It is here. It is a reflection of our psyche. Someone who has no conscience is an empty shell. We're seeing plenty of those types of people every time we watch the news. People that have no conscience. They are willing easily to kill, to rape, to steal, to maim, to lie. They are empty shells. 
They have a physical body, but they are demons. They're not human. Because they lack the conscience. Similarly, there are beings with very high quality who walk amongst us, who we can't perceive as having those qualities because of the conditioning of our consciousness. But what's universal amongst all these beings, angels and demons, masters and devils, whatever we want to call them, they all have consciousness at their level. They may or may not have physical bodies. But they all share consciousness. And this is universal amongst all living things. What's important about that is that we have it too. Which means that we have the potential to raise or lower our consciousness. And that is done simply by how we behave. How we act. How we use the consciousness. The problem is that we generally aren't aware of how we use it. We generally are just on autopilot, going through the motions, chasing our desires, living from day to day until we finally die. We don't really utilize these powers that are defined here. We're not really aware of our state of being. We're not really aware of perception. We're not aware of having an alert cognitive state. We just kind of go along from moment to moment, day to day, doing what we feel we need to do or want to do, but with ever, without ever really being aware of it without being aware of how we're using that energy. And this is precisely why we're in the problems that we're in. To change that, we need to learn about the consciousness, what it can do. It has some basic powers. And this is universal to all living things. The first is simply awareness. Nowadays, everybody's talking about awareness. All the talk shows are talking about awareness as if it's something new. Awareness is the very entry way to the most kindergarten level of spirituality. Awareness is simply a perception that is very broad. All living things have it to some degree. There's also attention, which is directed and specific. These two are complementary but different. And these are very technical terms. We don't use them lightly. Awareness is like a radiant light that sheds light in every direction. Attention is placed on one thing. Both function at the same time and even independent of each other. This is really important to understand how meditation works. You need to understand the difference between them and how to use them. For example, you can be aware of this room, you can be aware of the chair you're in, you can be aware of the temperature, you can be aware of how you're feeling in general, but your attention is on listening to what I'm explaining. This is the difference. It's simple, but needs to be clearly understood. But there's more to this. There's also mindfulness, another word that's getting tossed around a lot in a very vague way. Mindfulness is to have cognizance of the continuity of the consciousness. Meaning, from moment to moment. You see, when you sit down to watch TV, you're aware, you go, you sit on the couch, you turn the television on, and you're aware of doing these things. Your attention goes to the TV. But then you get sucked into the story or to whatever's happening on the television and you lose awareness of the room, and you lose awareness of the television, and you become in the show. You forget yourself. Isn't this a universal experience? We actually all want that, right? We want to sort of forget our problems and forget ourselves. But actually, that's a negative state of consciousness. Because all of these become mechanical. no longer aware of yourself. In other words, you enter into a state of hypnosis, hypnotized by the story, by the emotions, by the drama, and thus you forget reality. 
You become absorbed in an illusion and you forget reality. Now, most of us think there's nothing wrong with that. But actually, it creates a lot of problems for us. The fourth power of consciousness is visualization. This is the ability to perceive non-physical imagery. This is a very important power of the consciousness. That in these days, many meditation groups completely discard and actually tell you to avoid. The perception of non-physical imagery is a basic power of the consciousness. It's natural, it's normal, and it's necessary. We're going to talk a lot about these four throughout all the lectures we give. So we're just introducing the subject. The key thing is to understand this. Consciousness has the potential to increase to an infinite degree. This was explained by the Dalai Lama. And that's what this map represents. The infinite potential of the consciousness. But that infinite potential depends on its conditioning. To have the potential to do something is not the same as to do it. And to believe in it is meaningless. We all in this society talk about dreams and we say, oh, it's so beautiful. We have these dreams about the future and we encourage our kids to have dreams. Dream, you know, you can, if you can dream it, you can do it. If you want to be a doctor or a fireman, you can do it. Chase and pursue your dreams. But what we don't realize in that context is that dreams are illusions. And as long as we leave them as that, they're nothing. Really, nothing. If we have the dream of becoming a Buddha or a master, an angel, if we have the dream of going to heaven, it's beautiful, but meaningless. The actual experience is completely different from our dreams. And if we're not experiencing the progress of the soul towards the superior realms, we are not accessing it, and we won't. Because the development of the consciousness doesn't occur in the future. It occurs here and now, in the moment. Consciousness is about the present moment. The future doesn't exist. Neither does the past. But you see how much of our time and energy is spent projecting about the images of the past and dreaming about the images of the future and very rarely actively perceiving the present moment. Which means we live our lives in a dream state. Dreaming about the past, dreaming about the future, dreaming about what we want and don't want, meanwhile doing nothing. Just existing. This is really sad, but it's the state of humanity. We're talking about facts here. Everybody dreams about going to heaven, but who's making the changes in the conditioning of their consciousness to achieve it? It is a measurable result. It isn't a future result. It's a measurable one. In Tibetan Buddhism, it is said that if you want to know what will happen to you when you die... Look at what happens to you when you fall asleep tonight. Because the realm that you enter when you die is the exact same realm you go into when you dream. So if tonight when you go to sleep, you have no awareness of falling asleep and going into that world, the same thing will happen to you when you die. You will have no awareness of it. And then when you're reborn, it's like waking up in the morning. All of a sudden you'll be back in this body and blinking and wondering where you are. This is a measurable, factual experience that thousands upon tens of thousands upon hundreds of thousands of practitioners have confirmed as fact. And we can confirm as fact. We can develop the ability to let the physical body fall asleep 
which is Malkut. And for the consciousness to go out of the body to dream into the fifth dimension, which is here, Hod Natsah, this level. We can do that with awareness, with consciousness, and confirm its reality. Some people call this lucid dreaming, dream yoga, astral projection. There's a lot of fancy names for it. There's nothing fancy about it, though. We all go to that world every single time we fall asleep physically. The consciousness goes out, wanders around there, but doesn't realize it's there. It's dreaming. In the same way that it's dreaming in its physical life. But if you start awakening in your physical life, being aware of yourself from moment to moment all the time, you will start to do that in your life outside of your body too, every night. You'll start to remember more dreams. You'll start to be aware in your dreams. You'll start to confirm the reality that you are not your physical body. You are the consciousness. And you go out of your body every night. And there's a whole other life there that is actually more real than this life in the physical world. It's closer to God. It's more real, more vibrant, more alive. And this can be confirmed by anyone. So what we're explaining here is that there are degrees of consciousness. The Dalai Lama said there are infinite degrees. It's hard to talk about infinity. So we're going to narrow the range a little bit so we can understand what that means. Most importantly, we need to understand the difference between being awake and asleep. Spiritual people always th toss this word around being awake. Someone is awakened, they say. But very few people know what that means. To be awakened is not something extraordinary or supernatural. It is to be here and now and aware of it. To have the consciousness fully engaged in the present moment to the fullest capacity that you have to really use it. Now remember those four qualities, those four powers of the consciousness. Awareness, which is that spatial sense. Attention, which is directed. And mindfulness, which is being aware of the continuity of those perceptions. So to be aware is to be here and now, aware of where you are in your body. To be watching your body, feeling it, perceiving through all its senses. To be engaged in the moment. To actually be aware of what you're doing. Attention is that part of consciousness that's really looking at what you're doing. So I'm aware of walking around, but I'm paying attention to what I'm saying. But then there's also the mindfulness, which is the being aware of the continuity of that from moment to moment and not losing that continuity. Some of us can pay attention and be aware for a second, five seconds, 10 seconds, but then we get distracted by thoughts or feelings or memories, worries, concerns, and we fall asleep again. This is the distinction. Awake versus asleep. To be awake is to be here and now, present. But our capacity to be awake is completely different from the capacity that a master has. Someone like Jesus, for example, is extremely awake. Someone like Buddha, or Krishna, Moses. There are many examples of great masters who have great awakening meaning that they have a power of consciousness that is like our little match compared to a sun. Unimaginable how much power flows through their consciousness, their ability to perceive. So they see not just where they are physically, the way we do. You see, our consciousness can barely perceive the physical body. We're making effort to be present, to be in the moment. 
And we're trying to observe things, but it takes effort for us. It takes energy and its range is very limited. We're not really aware of much, even when we're making a lot of effort. And we can't pay attention to much, even when we make a lot of effort. And worse, we can't maintain the continuity, the mindfulness of what we're doing from moment to moment. So maybe here and now in class studying, we can be aware of ourselves for brief periods as I give the lecture, but there are probably you'll find are moments when you get distracted and you lose the train of what I'm talking about. And then you come aware of yourself again and think, oh wait, what's he talking about now? And five minutes passed or 10 minutes passed and we're not exactly sure how long we lost. There are periods of being aware and periods of being asleep. This shows that our mindfulness is not strong. Moreover, the range of our perceptions is limited. We can't even, we can barely perceive the body and through the senses, much less anything in other dimensions. A master can perceive multiple dimensions, not just physically. It doesn't matter if we believe that or not, it can be done. If we work, we can confirm it. So awake versus asleep. There's also conditioned versus unconditioned. Now, to be a conditioned consciousness means that our perceptions are filtered, meaning we don't see the reality. On the most fundamental level, our conscious is filtered by being in a physical body. We are perceiving through the senses of the body and those senses have a limited range. The eyes can only see the light that the physical eyes can see. We know there's much more light. The light that's being projected around us has an enormous range, but we only see a really tiny slice out of that because our physical eyes can't see more than that. Same with our hearing, same with our sense of touch our sense of smell, even our dogs smell more than we do. There's a lot more going on around us on every level and we have no idea about it. And we think we see everything, but we don't. We see a very narrow range, a very narrow band. And that's caused simply by physical conditioning. But that's not the most fundamental or most important conditioning that we suffer. Our mind our psyche, our perception is conditioned by our experiences, by our traumas, by our desires, our fears, our resentments, our anxieties, all of our stress, all of that collected baggage, which are the results of all of our previous actions. Our perceptions are filtered by all of that and we don't even have any awareness of it. When we see other people, we're always translating our perceptions according to our conditioning. When we see anything outside of us, we interpret those perceptions according to our conditioning without awareness of it. For example, after class, we can all go outside and a dog is out there. Every one of us will react differently to the same dog because of the experiences we had in the past. I know someone who was bit as a child, she is terrified of dogs. I know someone else who loves dogs, grew up with dogs, had lots of dogs, was bit, but doesn't care. Totally different experience, different background, different conditioning, different reaction, different response. One sees the dog and suffers emotionally. One sees the dog and is happy emotionally, both because of the conditioning. Neither one sees the dog for what it is. Both see the dog through the conditioning of the psyche. They're not seeing the reality. They don't see the soul of the dog. They see their memories of dogs. There's a big difference because we do that with people. We do that with ourselves. None of us see ourselves the way we really are. We see ourselves through our conditioning. 
And no one on the planet Earth sees you the way you see yourself. So what's the reality? We don't know. Our own perception of the outside world and the inside world is completely flawed. And we don't have any awareness of that because we are so conditioned. Why is this important? Because we suffer. We're suffering. Every being is suffering because of this, because we don't see reality. As much as we run around in our physical lives, in our external lives, trying to change our conditions outside, they never change the fundamental cause of our problems, which is our perception. We think buying that new thing will make us happy. Moving to a new city, getting a new car, a new boyfriend, a new girlfriend, going here, going there, and they never do. And then we keep trying again and again, never realizing that the problem isn't the external circumstances. It is our internal conditioning. We don't realize that we are not in the perfect state of consciousness. We are in a conditioned state. In Greek, the state of perfect consciousness is called nous. This word has a lot of depth and subtlety. The perfect state of consciousness is one that is completely unconditioned. To use a popular word, we can say liberated or self-realized. This is the consciousness that knows itself completely, is fully cognizant of its reality, its true nature, is absolutely free of all conditioning, and is completely happy. It is a radiant, brilliant, beautiful, wisdom, love. It is a reflection of all that is the most divine. This state of consciousness is that light that projects through the eyes and being of masters like Jesus and Buddha and Moses and Krishna and Padmasambhava and Milarepa and Nargarjuna and all these great masters that everybody talks about. It is this light at the top of the tree called the Ein Sof Or in Hebrew. That means limitless light, which in Sanskrit is Amitabha. It is the light of all the Buddhas. The ultimate light of divinity that projects out and gives life to all things. We have that potential in us. Every living thing can become an embodiment of that. The perfection of that in Sanskrit is called paramartasatya, which means an embodiment of absolute knowledge, an embodiment of absolute happiness, cognizance. It is a perfect being. There are many such beings. And we can barely understand them because we're so far from that. But to know that it is possible and that it exists and that we can become that is very important. It gives us hope, something to work towards. So we need to be in the state of being that is working towards that goal. And in Greek, it's called dianoia. This also is a very subtle word with a lot of deep meanings, dianoia. We call it the third state of consciousness. It is the state of consciousness of someone who is constantly, from moment to moment, working to be conscious of themselves, using every atom of their power, physically, emotionally, mentally, spiritually, to change, to liberate themselves from their conditioning, to eliminate from themselves all their anger, their pride, their lust, their fear, their greed, their envy, their gluttony, their laziness, all of it 
to become liberated from all that conditioning and to become a real human being, to become an embodiment of love, of diligence, of generosity, of heroic action for others, and all the other perfections of the soul. In other words, this is a person who's regenerating themselves. Seeking to kill all of the impurities inside and give birth to all of the purity of the divinity. Beautiful goal, very difficult to achieve, but it can be done. Then we have pistis, a Greek term, also with a lot of subtlety and depth. Here we use it to, defer, to refer to all the common people. The common level of humanity. All the people in the world who think that they're awake and think that they're good people and think they're going to heaven, but they're wrong. It's just the level of the common person who's completely asleep, wants to do good, but can't. Wants to help others, but inevitably winds up helping themselves first. Wants to be loving, but inevitably has anger and hate and resentment and jealousy and can't seem to change it. That's pistis, the average person asleep and dreaming that they're awake. And then, of course, we have the degenerated ones, acacia. These are those who are more or less animals in human bodies. People that are bestial. That have no interest in anything but satisfying their desires. And they don't care what it costs them. There are a lot of people like that. And they seem to be growing in number. These are people that will take whatever they can from whoever they can, anytime they can, and they don't care of the consequences. Now, all of us have the potential to be any of these, but it has nothing to do with beliefs. It has to do with our state of being from moment to moment. How do we behave? How do we act? How do we use our energy? What we believe, what we think, what we dream means nothing. We are proven through our actions, through facts. That's what's represented in these images. Levels and levels and levels of consciousness, experiences of living that are determined by the conditioning of our soul, our consciousness. The image on the left, of course, is the tree of life, which is used in all the Western traditions, even if they've forgotten about it. All the Western religions are based on this image of the tree of life. All of these terms are hidden throughout the Bible. They're Hebrew. If you don't read the Bible in Hebrew, you're not reading the Bible. The image on the right is the Bhava Chakra, which is the fundamental metaphysics of the Eastern traditions. And it represents not only the six kingdoms of different beings, but Pratitya Samutpada, which are the, is the chain of causality of all things. In the center is the transmigration of the consciousness through levels of existence. And in the very heart are the three causes of suffering. Ignorance, craving, and aversion. Both of these symbols talk about the exact same thing from a slightly different angle. Both of them are maps of your soul. They also reflect the exterior world, all the beings that migrate through nature, angels and devils, spirits, gods, demigods, all of that's here. But that doesn't mean anything to us. What should mean something to us is who are we, where are we going? How do we change for the better? These maps reflect that. They can teach us that. Most significantly, they represent the potential to change, the possibility that we can change. That's why this image on the right, people call it the wheel of samsara or the wheel of life, but that's not actually the name. The name is Bhava Chakra. That means wheel of becoming. And that's really important. That wheel 
is the motion of our own actions from moment to moment. And that motion is what determines what we will become. It also means that what we are now was made by what we did before. Our parents did not make us this way. Neither did our boss or our husband or wife or girlfriend or boyfriend, our friends, our siblings. It wasn't our country or our city. It wasn't our education. We made ourselves as we are through our choices. And not just what college we chose to go to or what types of clothes we decided to wear. Our choices from moment to moment. How we respond to life is what determines who we are. This wheel shows six general kingdoms of experience. At the top, the gods. Those uh, people, those beings who have everything. They have power. They have food. They have water. They have all the fine clothes. They have everything they could possibly want. But they're not happy. Because others are trying to take it from them. And they still want more. And as much as they eat, they're never satisfied. As much as they drink, they're never satisfied. With all the fine clothes they get, they're never satisfied. They need more and more. Moreover, at any instant, they could lose it all. So they live with this fear that all this great kingdom that I've built is going to be taken from me. So we call them gods, and we think, oh, these are like, you know, Zeus or Krishna or these gods from different pantheons. No, this also represents people on this planet. And truthfully speaking, if we look at humanity as a whole and the observation of the facts, most people in places like the United States and Europe could be considered gods. Because we also have access to all the food, all the water, all the fine goods, all the fine clothes. We can get whatever we want whenever we want it. But we're never happy. There's some statistic that says that if you earn more than 50000 a year, you are in the top 5% of the world population. None of us realize that. We think we're poor and we don't have enough. We don't realize that we are gods and demigods on this planet. We're always craving more. That's this craving here in the center. Always craving more. And always avoiding pain, embarrassment, afraid of poverty, afraid of being poor, afraid of being sick, afraid of being rejected, afraid of being judged. Many fears and many cravings, many desires that are never satisfied. And what keeps this little cycle moving is the ignorance of who we really are. We think we are this person with this name and this body and this look and this style and this taste in music and clothes and these politics. And it's all lies. It's all stuff that we've just picked up along the way. It means nothing. We don't know who we are as a soul. We don't know our level of being. We don't know what's going to happen when we die. We don't even realize that we're going to die. So you see, no matter what kingdom we belong to on that wheel, we're suffering. And all the kingdoms on that wheel suffer. The gods, the demigods, the human beings, the animals, the hungry spirits, and the demons. All suffer according to their conditioning. In Buddhism, in the, in the East, all the Eastern traditions, suffering is dukkha. We tend to think of that word as just like when you have to go to the doctor and get a shot. So that's suffering. Or you get cancer and that's suffering. Yes, those are suffering. But that's not the entirety of suffering. That is not the real meaning of the word suffering. That's just the first type. The obvious suffering. The suffering of suffering. Pain, birth, illness, growing old and dying. These are obvious 
and every one of us has to face them. They are unavoidable. Yet still we want to avoid them. We have so much aversion to all of these, and we suffer because of that aversion. We do our best to avoid the reality of growing old. We get surgeries. We wear all kinds of makeup. We try all kinds of things to avoid the fact of aging and avoid the fact of death. We do not want to face it. And we suffer because of that. If we really faced the reality and understood it, we wouldn't suffer. Especially if we were preparing every day for death. You see that phrase I told you earlier, if you want to know what happens when you die, look at what happens when you fall asleep at night. That isn't just to scare you. That phrase is given so that you will realize if I can understand what happens when I die, I can be prepared to die and not be afraid. You see, personally, I'm not afraid to die at all. Pain, yes. <laughs> I am afraid of pain. I'm not over that yet. But I'm not afraid to die because I know what will happen. I have no fear of that. You can have that. You can train yourself every day to comprehend and understand what the process of death is so that you're not afraid of it. Thus, you will suffer less. And then you can help others to not suffer. What better use of your life than to reduce your suffering and the suffering of others? But you see, this is only the first type of suffering. Deeper is the suffering of change. We all have this anxiety or stress of trying to hold on to things that are constantly changing. We're trapped in this illusion. All of us want to retain our youth. You see how people are desperate to retain youth. They want to look young. There are, I see these old people that are dressing like teenagers and they get all these surgeries to try to look like young people because they are trapped in this illusion they are suffering the suffering of change. They cannot accept the reality of getting old. And what else? We can't accept the reality that our children will grow up and leave, that our children will get sick, that our children will die. We can't accept the reality that the vast majority of external circumstances are completely beyond our control. We are always thinking trying to figure out how can I control my life? How can I control what's going on so that I can have security and comfort? You never will be able to do it. You will waste your whole life chasing that illusion. And the vast majority of people on this planet suffer from that, this anxiety or stress of always trying to manipulate and change and hold things that cannot be held. This is a very deep suffering. If you really contemplate this, you'll see it is at the root of the majority of the problems we face as a planet. We want this idealistic belief of being what we see in the ads. Those young people in the ads that are so pretty and so handsome with all the fancy clothes, the nice car, the nice house, the, the smart kids that are on their way to being doctors, this perfect life that our media has held up in front of us as a carrot to make themselves rich. And we all pursue that blindly, not realizing it's 100% a lie and that life doesn't work like that. But we're so conditioned by it, we don't realize it. This is the suffering of change. Deeper and harder to understand is the suffering of conditioned existence. Very difficult to grasp this. It's subtle. It is a pervasive unsatisfactoriness that no matter what we do, what we achieve, what we gain, what we gather, we are never content. And the reason for that is we have a mistaken perception of what our self is. We don't see the reality. We think we get this job, this education, we live in this place, we get married, we have kids, we do all the things that society tells us and we will be happy and it's not true. 
because none of those things last. They are fleeting. They are like a mirage. And all the while, we ignore what can bring contentment, and that is to know who we really are, which is mapped on this image. But it's inside of us, not outside. What is our reality? What is our being? Some call that God. But that term has a lot of baggage. The term being is better because it's an active state. What is our true self? We don't see it. We don't know, so we suffer. And all of this is because of that. On that wheel that we showed you, the very center has these three creatures, and the root one is ignorance. That is the ignorance of the true nature of oneself. It is to not know the reality of oneself. It is the center of the whole wheel. It rotates around that fundamental ignorance. You see, this is why we meditate. This is why. To learn from experience about reality. To cut through all the illusions. And we are liberated from those illusions and the conditioning when, we de- when our delusions and contaminated karmic actions are exhausted. This is a quote from Nagarjuna, who's a great master of Buddhism. Liberation from suffering is not a matter of belief. Billions of people believe billions of things and all of them continue to suffer. No matter what you believe, it doesn't change your suffering. The fundamental facts. So belief doesn't help us here. What helps us is to deal with delusion. You see how close that word is to the word illusion? It is an image. A delusion is an image, but it's psychological. Not outside. It's the delusions that we have in our heads. It has nothing to do with anyone else. It's all about ourselves. We are liberated when our delusions are exhausted, when we can see the illusions for what they are. When you see and realize that something you thought was real isn't real, it loses its power. If someone comes to you and calls you a terrible word, it hurts your pride. You feel pain. If your best friend says it, your parent says it, your sibling says it, your teacher, someone you respect says it, they call you a really bad name, it hurts a lot. But if a child says it, it doesn't hurt. You look at the child and say, oh, you little brat. And you smile. Or if a sick person says it, someone who's really sick and they lash at you, you're trying to help them and they lash out at you and call you a bad name, It doesn't hurt you because you understand that they're suffering. You see, the word is the same and you receive it in a completely different way. The word is not what's different. It's the quality that you give the word. The value you give it is what makes the difference. We can learn that same phenomena with everything we perceive. When we learn how to perceive things for what they truly are, we reduce our suffering. When we truly realize that the big fat bank account and the big fat ring on our finger 
and all the things that society tells us we're supposed to have really don't have the meaning that we thought they had, we suffer less. When we realize that our age is irrelevant, that our beauty is irrelevant, we suffer less. When we realize that we really don't care what other people think about how we dress or how we talk, we suffer less. We suffer because of the value we place on illusions. That's these delusions, and they're very deep. And we could talk for hours and hours about many examples. Contaminated karmic actions. The word karma simply means to do. The Bible says in several places that we receive from our actions. We reap what we sow. As you do, you receive. That's all karma means. Cause and effect. We are in the circumstances we're in because of our previous actions. If we want better circumstances, we need to perform superior actions, better actions. That's all. When we renounce a lower desire, a lower action in favor of a superior one, we receive superior result. It's very simple. The difficulty is letting go of the desires. Recognizing that a desire that we really want to fulfill is not as good as performing the superior type of action. So these two in, compare, in uh, union with each other, undoing the delusions and performing superior actions are what lead us to become liberated from conditioning. This is how we change our level of being. This is how we change our relationship with this wheel of becoming, how we change our relationship with the tree of life. We raise our level of being. Anyone know the story in the Bible of Jacob who fell asleep with his head on a stone and saw a vision of angels going up and down a ladder? That is this ladder. The ladder that goes up and down from the superior to the inferior worlds. That is in us, not outside of us. So how do we make that change? We work with facts. Meditation starts in this moment. Meditation is not something that you only do once a week, once every two weeks, for 10 minutes. If you really want to learn to meditate, start now. Meditation begins with learning to use consciousness all the time in everything you do, to be aware of oneself, to deal with facts, to set aside beliefs, cut through illusions, deal with reality. That's how real meditation is born. It's our state of being. Being aware of one's own existence, one's condition, one's sensations, one's mind. Not just thinking about it, but watching it, observing oneself. Meditation starts this, with this, from moment to moment. Being aware of oneself paying attention to oneself, being mindful in a continuous way from moment to moment, perceiving actively. Meditation is a state of consciousness. And that state results from having the consciousness very aware and in the present moment. And you can't achieve that only trying to do it for 10 minutes a day or only trying to do it every couple of weeks. It has to be a continual effort, constant. And when you get into that rhythm of always being the present moment, always bringing your attention to the here and now, you start to train yourself and you develop skill. You get stronger. It's the same as when you go to the gym and you try to do exercise. If you only exercise once a month, you're not gonna get anywhere, right? Everybody knows that. Same with a diet. If you're going to only diet one day out of the month, you're not going to get anywhere. It has to be a lifestyle. And the same with meditation. It's more than just a lifestyle. It's a way of being. Constant. 
So from that point of view, it seems difficult in the beginning. And that's represented on this image here. This map shows stages of the development of concentration, which is attention. And as you're working to develop attention, we all start down at the beginning as the person who's practicing chasing after the two animals, the elephant and a monkey, and they represent the wild mind that we all have. So if any of you tried to meditate, you realize you sit to meditate and the mind just keeps running and it's wild. It's hard to control it. And here you see a raging fire. That's the effort that it takes in the beginning. It takes a lot of energy, a lot of effort. But as you look up this path, as this uh, monk begins to get closer to gaining control of the animals, the fire decreases. It gets smaller until it's gone. And that represents that in the beginning, it takes so much effort and energy to learn this. But the, with experience, and as your conscious muscle gets stronger, it becomes easier until it becomes effortless. Meditation itself is effortless. The state of meditation requires no exertion at all. It just happens. If you're exerting yourself to meditate, you're meditating in the wrong way. To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Gloria and Publishing, available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy. Thank you.